Our topic today is science, sorry, scripture and science declare a young earth. You've got to get the order correct. Scripture first, then science declare a young earth. Well, when it comes to the creation of the earth and the universe and its age, the age of the earth, God has told us in Genesis, that's our textbook, what happened. Genesis is his eyewitness testimony attested to by Jesus Christ as literal history. That's right. Jesus confirmed what God had given us as the eyewitness testimony in Genesis. And we read in Genesis that God spoke the earth and the universe into existence instantaneously. He spoke and it was so. He commanded and it was so. It wasn't over billions of years. It was instantaneously. Therefore, the evidence must be understood based on what God told us he did. It's not a matter of what we think or what could have happened. It's a matter of what God tells us he did. And God has not deceived us. We know that the scriptures point out that God can't lie. He's not a man that he can lie. So God didn't deceive us because he told us. We deceive ourselves, in fact, if we ignore his eyewitness testimony, the account in Genesis, as a literal historical record. That's clear. We deceive ourselves if we ignore the eyewitness account. And what did Jesus Christ, the creator, tell us? We know he's the creator because that's testified to in John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1. And Jesus said in Mark 13, 19, the creation which God created. He also said in Mark 10, 6 and Matthew 19, verse 4, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Notice that? From the beginning of the creation, not after billions of years of cosmic, geologic and uh, and biological evolution. And he made them male and female, man and woman, Adam and Eve. So, when we contrast the secular timeline of history with the creator's timeline of history, we see the stark contrast. The secular evolutionary timeline of history begins with a big bang, 13.7 plus billions of years ago, whatever the latest estimate is, of course. And the earth formed only 4.56 billion years ago. And man, well, he's only very recently, recent. He's like the, the last blink in time since the very beginning. Yet Jesus, the creator who was there, who told us in his word what happened, we read that the earth was created on day one, man on day six, that was about 6,000 years ago. So compared to today, looking back, man was, was at the beginning of the creation. God made man at the beginning. And that's Jesus' perspective as he told us. So how old is the earth? Well, as we've just seen, the Genesis account tells us that God created the earth on day one of the creation week and man on day six. So that means the earth is only five days older than man. And remember, we just quoted this from Mark 10, 6 and Matthew 19, 4, where Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And so the earth is only five days older than man, made at the beginning. So the biblical chronology of human history is relatively short. We read those ge genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 and in, repeated in Luke 3, verses 23 to 28. And the available evidence points to human history and cultures only being thousands of years long. And we'll come back to that later. We first of all have to focus on the, what the scriptures tell us. So from the scriptures, the earth is only thousands of years old. We have that literal historical record in the scriptures. You know, Adam was so many years old when he had his sons and they lived for so many years and then they died, etc. Those genealogies matter because they present the chronology of God's plan of salvation, uh, redemption and salvation. They are the ge genealogy of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. That's right. Jesus can be called the last Adam or the second Adam, 
because we could trace his family lineage back to the first Adam. It's the story of his history. Those genealogies are Jesus' family history, why he can be claimed to be truly man, because he was related back to the first man, Adam. And so those genealogies are incredibly important because they place Jesus' life, death and resurrection are firmly rooted in the human timeline of history. Well, it, we have to answer a few more questions. What do the scriptures tell us about those days, or the Hebrew word yom, of the creation week? Were they literal days? Well, let's look at the usage of the word yom, the Hebrew word for day, used there in Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at the usage everywhere else outside of Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament. After all, when you do a survey like that, it should show you how the word was used and understood. And what do we find? When the word yom or day is used with a number, first day, second day, third day, etc., or 10 days, in the plural or singular, it's used 410 times outside of Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, and it always, always means an ordinary day. And then, when the word evening and morning are used together, without the word yom, 38 times, everywhere else outside Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, it always only means an ordinary day. And then when the words evening and morning are used together with the word yom, day, 23 times outside Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, they, the word yom always means an ordinary day. And finally, when the word night is used with the word day, yom, 52 times outside Genesis chapter 1 throughout the Old Testament, it always means an ordinary day. So shouldn't the usage outside Genesis chapter 1 dictate our understanding of what we read in Genesis chapter 1? Of course, absolutely. That's being consistent. In fact, the word yom, day, is used 2,301 times in the Old Testament. So why, why do people only question the usage of the word yom, day, in Genesis chapter 1? It's a good question, isn't it? The answer is very simple. It has nothing to do with what the Hebrew word means and how it's used in the Old Testament. It has everything to do with what the scientists say about the age of the earth. In other words, people question the word yom's usage in Genesis chapter 1 only because of the claims of the finite fallible scientists about the age of the earth. Shouldn't we Instead, defer to the almighty God who never tells a lie, who's infallible and who knows everything and who has told us what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and use the word consistently throughout the Old Testament. After all, what do we read in Genesis chapter 1? Night, evening, morning, one day. Evening, morning, second day. Evening, morning, third day. Evening, morning, fourth day. Evening, morning, fifth day. Evening, morning, sixth day. Notice the repetition. The use of the numeral. The use of the word evening and morning. The use of the word night. Everywhere else outside Genesis 1 in the Old Testament, the word yom used in those contexts can only ever mean an ordinary day. Do you think, therefore, by repeating this and using that formula you know, repeatedly, God, by his Spirit, was trying to tell us that these were ordinary literal days. Of course, we can come to no other conclusion that that's exactly what God intended us to understand. And after all, does God need millions of years? We'll come to that in a minute. But let's confirm it outside Genesis chapter 1. We read in Exodus chapter 20 where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And remember the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, verse 8. And what was the justification God gave to Moses and the children of Israel? Verse 11, 
For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And that's repeated again in Exodus 31, 17 and 18. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses two tablets, tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Notice that? Elsewhere in Scripture, we're told that all Scripture is inspired of God, but this Scripture, in six days, was actually written by God's finger on those tables of stone. So you see, if God can't be trusted to write what he means, how can we trust him anywhere else in the Scriptures? When he's written this clearly in Exodus, in six days... You will work for six days and rest for one. Do you think the children of Israel think they ha- thought they had to work for millions of years before they got a day off? Absolutely not. They understood that God was saying, you will work for six literal days because I worked for six literal days when I created the heavens, the earth, the sea and everything in them. That's an encompassing description of the whole universe. By the way, I love this cartoon. Six days, yep, says the girl. The boy says, six truly, really days? Yep, says the girl. You're sure it says six days? Yes. I wonder why he took so long. See, that's a different question. Is Why did God take as long as six days? God could have done it in six seconds if he chose to. Yes, he could have chosen to do it over millions of years. But he tells us he did it in six days. Why? We're told in Exodus 20, Exodus 31, You will work for six days because I worked for six days when I created everything. It couldn't be any plainer when you compare Scripture with Scripture and look at the usage of that Hebrew word yom for day. Well, what do the scholars say? This is Pat Pan at Wheaton College. He says this, It is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days, that man was created on the sixth day, that death and chaos entered the world after the fall of Adam and Eve, that all of the fossils were the result of the catastrophic deluge, universal deluge which spared only Noah's family and the animals therewith. Notice what I left out. Does he believe that they were six solar days? No, because he slips in this phrase, without regard to all the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science. Oh yes, the straightforward understanding is six literal days, solar days, but no, we've got to consider what the scientists have said. No, that's not the way how you conduct your investigation of Scripture. It's God-inspired, God-breathed. He made it absolutely clear the scientists weren't there, they don't know everything, They sometimes make mistakes. God was there. He never lies. He knows everything and he never makes mistakes. Who should we trust? God. Well, what about James Barr, Hebrew scholar and oral professor of the interpretation of Holy Scriptures at Oxford University, a world-renowned Hebraist. He wasn't a believer, but this is what he said. As far as I know, There is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that, one, creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. The figures contained in the Genesis genealogy provided by simple addition of chronology from the beginning of the world up to the latest stages of the biblical story. And C, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except for those on the ark. You see what he's saying? He mightn't believe that, but he's saying that's what the writer intended us to understand, that those were literal days, a literal fall and a literal flood. So the language cannot be any clearer. Do you believe God and trust his word or do you trust the words of the scientists? That's really the question. Well, how do we know that the earth is only thousands of years old? Well, I already referred to those genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11. We can go through those meticulously, as many scholars have done, and it's very clear that it's a father-son relationship because we're told how old the father was when he gave birth to his son. And so it goes from father to son to father to son. 
And we come to the conclusion when we add up all those genealogies that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. About 2,000 years to the flood to Abraham, uh, to, to, from Abraham to, from the creation to Abraham, from Abraham to the Jesus, another 2,000 years, another 2,000 years today, to today. We have to remember that the Bible is God's history book of the universe. Well, once we've established clearly what the scriptures tell us, they declare emphatically that the earth is young, man is young, God created instantly, literally over six literal days, only thousands of years ago. What does the science tell us? Well, we have to remember that data needs to be interpreted. Scientists make observations of the world. A rock is a rock. A rock doesn't come with a label on it. Oh, hi, I'm six million years old. No, it's the scientists examining that rock that impose an interpretation. And those interpretations are based on assumptions, man's theories, man's ideas. And the prevailing philosophy is that through millions of years of death and struggle, man evolved and, and, and everything came into existence. Through millions of years of suffering, extinction, killing, disease, pain, struggle, death, life came from non-life. And pond scum eventually became people. That's the prevailing view. But we remember, they're looking at the evidence, the observations, through glasses of their own making, their interpretations. Well, as Christians, we need to put on biblical glasses. That's right, not just these physical glasses that I need to be able to see clearly. We see even clearer when we take God at his word and use his word to understand the world around us. And we do that, when we do that, we can see that the scientific evidence, the observations in the real world in real time, confirm what the Bible already declares about the age of the world, the age of the earth. Well, various methods have been used to date the age of the earth, and most people don't realise that 90% of them give a young age. That's right. Most dating methods give a young age for the world. And I've got a list here of many that have been used, but there are hundreds of them. So why is it that the scientists focus on the 10, less than 10% that are given old age? It's because they want millions of years to, for the time for evolution to occur. Without the millions of years, evolution is dead in the water. Without the millions of years, the Bible is right and God has created. So it's not a scientific issue ultimately, it's a spiritual issue. And so they choose the evidence that seemingly gives an old age. And the one that is particularly used today is radioactive decay. You can see I've got it highlighted in, on the screen there, number 53, uranium decay. Most people are familiar with uranium, uranium dating. Well, these are the radioactive dating methods. So I want you to just be patient. This is not difficult to understand, but it's very important that I give you a glimpse into how these methods work and what the assumptions are behind them. So let's work through this carefully together today. First of all, when radioactive atoms in rocks decay, they result in stable atoms of different elements. So radioactive atoms of uranium decay and produce stable atoms of uranium. Just some terminology here. The decaying radioactive atoms are called the parent isotopes or parent atoms and the resultant stable isotopes or atoms are called the daughter isotopes or atoms. The reason why we use the word isotopes is because there's, there's different varieties of uranium and they're called isotopes, the different varieties, uranium-234, 35, 38, etc. Well, here are the major methods that are used. You can see on the left-hand column the parent atom or isotope and the resultant stable daughter atom. The radioactive parent 
and the stable daughter. First of all, there's nitrogen-14, which decays... Sorry, there's carbon-14, which decays to nitrogen-14. Now, some people think that the scientists use carbon-14 to date rocks. If you hear anyone say that, you know they don't know what they're talking about because radiocarbon is not used to date rocks because most rocks don't contain any carbon. And in any case, carbon, radiocarbon decays so rapidly, it, it only gives ages of thousands of years. So we're not going to deal with that in any detail this morning, today, but we'll come back to it. But the ones that most people are familiar are uranium, decays to lead, and there's two varieties of uranium, 238 and 235. We don't need to get into all the heavy details. Just uranium decays to lead, potassium decays to argon, rubidium decays to strontium, samarium decays to neodymium. And you'll hear me use the names of these elements. Most of them you've probably heard of, but samarium and neodymium? Yeah, because they're called rare earth elements. They're very rare but they're very needed in today's technology. For example, your cell phone contains some of those metals, those rare earth metals. Neodymium is very important for those wind farms. The neodymium makes a, a stronger magnet to generate electricity as the turbine blades rotate. So these are very strategic uh, elements in today's technology world. Well, enough of that. Let's look at how this, these methods work. First of all, we observe that minerals, rocks and fossils contain some of these parent radioactive atoms or isotopes and daughter isotopes or daughter atoms. So what does a geologist do? He goes and collects rock samples and the rock samples are chemically tested for these atoms. And that's a simple procedure. Well, it, it's highly sophisticated, but simple in a sense, but it's a chemical test and you get numbers as to the various atoms that are present in your rock. Well, you've got to interpret those numbers. You've got to take the chemical analysis and interpret them. And uh, if, the, if we know the rate of radioactive decay, that is how long it takes from a parent atom to change into a daughter atom, and we assume that it's remained constant at the rate we measure today, then it can be calculated how long it has taken the measured amount of daughter atoms to accumulate, and that becomes the rock's age. Well, you can see on the screen, I've got a simple analogy to try and show you how this works. You know, the hourglass clock. You have the two glass bowls, and I've put red sand grains in the top, to, in the top bowl to represent the parent atoms. Well, those sand grains fall and they turn into daughter atoms, the green atoms. The falling is analogous to radioactive decay. So we know that if you start with all the sand grains at the top, there are only red sand grains at the top glass bowl, that within, within an hour, they'll have all fallen to the bottom. That's why it's called an hourglass. They fall to the bottom within an hour and become green atoms. Okay, very simple to understand. How do you get an age? Well, suppose you're working in the kitchen, you're going to bake a cake, and you put the cake in the oven, you turn the hourglass clock up so all the atoms are at the top, the red sand grains are at the top, you leave the room, you come back some time later, you want to know how long you've been out of the kitchen, how long your cake's been baking in the oven. Well, you look at the hourglass clock and you do an analysis. You observe how many red sand grains there still are and how many green sand grains there are at the bottom. And you notice that there's still 50% at the top and now there's 50% of green atoms at the bottom. So how long have you been out of the room? 50% of one hour is, you guessed it, 30 minutes. So you can tell how long... So that's how it works with the geologists. You measure the amount of uranium and lead atoms. You, you know the rate at which uranium decays to lead. You count how many atoms of lead you've got now and you back calculate to when all those, those uh, lead atoms were originally uranium atoms and that's supposed to be the rock's age when the process started. 
It's not that difficult to understand at all. But, but, you may have already detected that there are three crucial assumptions. You might not have recognised them all, but there are three very critical assumptions. I'm going to quickly show you what those are. First, assumption number one. The amounts of parent and daughter atoms at the beginning when the rock form must be known. In other words, you have to know the initial conditions. So you have to know, for example, that when the rock formed, there were only red atoms. Or if there were green atoms, how many there were? Well, in your kitchen, you knew what the starting conditions were because you turned the hourglass clock up so that there are only red atoms to begin with. But tell me, how many scientists were there when the rocks formed to know whether there are only red atoms in the rock and no green atoms? What if there were already a lot of green atoms in the rock? If they assumed that there were no green atoms to begin with, and yet there were, their calculation would be totally wrong. They'd be erroneous. They would get an erroneous age. Well, what about assumption number two? All the daughter atoms measured today must only have been derived by in-situ radioactive decay of the parent atoms. In other words, it has to have been a closed system, no contamination. You know, what would have happened if while you're out of the room, your mischievous 10-year-old son came in, lifted up the lid and put more red atoms, more red sand grains in the top glass bowl? When you come back in and do your calculation, you're going to be wrong because he contaminated the system. How many geologists and scientists have been out there looking at the rocks for millions of years to make sure they haven't become contaminated? None. They don't know for sure. Contamination is a real problem. And then thirdly, assumption number three, the radioactive decay rate must have been constant at today's measured rate. The rate has to be constant. Well, you know that because you've tested your hourglass clock and the sand grains keep falling. But the geologists, have they been there for millions of years in the past, testing all the time that uranium has always decayed at the same rate through all those millions and billions of years? No. So how do they know? They've assumed it. What if radioactive decay was faster in some catastrophic event during the past? Ah. Huh. That would throw off all their dating calculations. Absolutely. That's why we have to conclude that none of these assumptions are provable. Why? Because the past cannot be observed and measured. We can't go back millions of years and test what it was like back then because all we have to, is today. So these assumptions are not even reasonable. The scientists weren't there. Daughter atoms may, in fact, have been inherited when the rock forms. As I said before, there may have been green atoms in the rock when it formed. And more green atoms might have been added after that due to contamination. Now, I want you to understand I'm not, I'm not arguing against the quality of the chemical analyses. If you saw the laboratories that are built with millions of dollars you would realise that it's a very sophisticated process to do these chemical analyses. And the quality is top-notch, no question about it. But the chemical analysis has to be interpreted to derive the age. And so we're questioning the interpretation because of these three critical assumptions that are not only, proven, not only able to be proven, but they're not even reasonable. Now, assumption number one is well known to be violated by inheritance from the sources of the rocks. And I want to give you examples. It's not, don't take my word for it. I want to give you examples, many that have come from the secular scientific literature. And assumption number two, a closed system, is also violated by inherited isotopes or contamination, which cannot always be detected. Let me give you some examples. Well... Just two days ago, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of this historic event, the May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington eruption. 
And uh, we learn a number of lessons from that eruption. And here's one of them. The top of the volcano was blasted away. In subsequent years, as lava oozed out, it formed a new dome inside the, the crater. And the last of these, there were six of them in fact, this last one it still persists today, we could actually watch the lavas flow day by day to build up that cone. And so uh, we know that when the sample was taken in 1992 of a lava flow that flowed out onto that crater, in that crater to form that dome in 1986, and then that sample was sent in 1996 to the laboratory for an analysis. The rock formed in 1986, it was tested in 1996, so by observation it was only 10 years old. What results were obtained by the potassium argon dating method? The whole rock gave an age of 0.35 million years, and one of the minerals gave an age of up to 2.8 million years for a rock that was only 10 years old. What was the conclusion? The conclusion was that the rock contained too much argon. You see, gases such as argon are also in the gases that come out of the volcano. They're down there in the source when the, when the lava forms. And so when it comes out, if that, all that argon doesn't escape, when the rock cools, some of it is trapped inside the rock and it won't give you the true age of the rock. Now, take my word for us, this is well known in the scientific literature. Here are a list of examples and you can see the references there. Let me just highlight this one in Hawaii, an eruption in 1800 and 1801 and it gave ages up to 23 million years based on this potassium argon dating method. And that's well known in the literature that these samples inherited argon from their sources. One famous study uh, looked at a number of these lava flows and you can see the examples here. This is a separate potassium argon or argon-argon dating study in fact. And you can see these are historic known lava flows in Hawaii, Italy, California and Arizona gave ages of hundreds of thousands of years up to 1.5 million years for lava flows that were barely hundreds to even just over a thousand years old, 2,000 years old as you can see from the uh, example there in Italy. So that's a real problem, inheritance from the mantle. We also see this when 10 diamonds from the Demic Re Democratic Republic of the Congo were dated using potassium argon and they gave an age of six billion years. Yet the earth is only four and a half billion years old. So the geologists knew the results were wrong because the diamonds couldn't be older than the earth itself. And when they did some more investigations, they found that the, that the diamonds inherited argon trapped in those diamonds, extra argon. What about this 14 basalts that had been recently erupted on different ocean islands, islands out there in the oceans, gave a rubidium strontium age of 2 billion years. They'd been observed to erupt recently. And yet they gave a rubidium strontium age of 2 billion years. The same ocean island basalts also gave lead lead ages, that's using the, the end members of the two uranium decay chains, of between 1 and 2 billion years. And this has is, is caused geologists to scratch their heads for over 50 years. It's been called the lead paradox. It's in the literature. It's well known. And the answer is that these lavas have inherited these daughter isotopes from their mantle sources and it has nothing to do with the age of the rocks. Let me give you another example. In the Grand Canyon, in the western Grand Canyon, there are volcanoes on the north rim and a couple on the south rim and the lavas have trickled down the walls of the canyon. They're called the Eurinkerit Plateau Basalts. And these are very recent because they, they erupted and flowed down the walls of the canyon. So it was after the Grand Canyon had been carved and in fact there's evidence that some of these last eruptions were seen by the Native Americans. 
And here we see one of those volcanoes, and you can see the lavas. I put the arrow there to show that how the lava spilled down and they actually blocked the Colorado River. What results do we obtain? Potassium argon gave ages of about half a million to 1.1 million, 1.2 million. Rubidium strontium, 1,143 million years. Lead, lead, 2,600 million years for recently erupted lavas. Now, the interesting thing is that deep in the Grand Canyon, up in the eastern Grand Canyon, below all those rock layers with the fossils in them that were deposited by the flood, right down in the inner gorge, in the deep basement rocks, there are other lava flows, the Cardenas basalt. And they give a rubidium strontium age, you can see it there on the screen, 1,111 million years. Notice that? The rubidium strontium age for the oldest ancient lava flows in the Grand Canyon are approximately the same as the rubidium strontium age for the youngest lava flows in the Grand Canyon that came out recently. What does that tell us? Well, these lavas came from the upper mantle below the Grand Canyon. And because it's in the same region, the ancient and the recent came from the same mantle source. So, these lavas have inherited the same chemistry from the mantle. It has nothing to do with the age of these rocks. It has everything to do with the chemistry of the source rocks down there in the mantle. What about contamination? Well, let follow through as I explain on this diagram. You see on the left, imagine on the ground, a granite, okay? And that line represents the boundary between a granite and the host rocks. You can see that to, to the right. The granite is supposed to be 54 million years old. The host rocks next to it are supposed to be 1,375 million years old. But what did the geologists find? The closer they got to the granite in testing the ages of those host rocks, the younger the ages got. Okay, let me show you graphically. I know graphs are difficult to understand. The red vertical line is the boundary between the granite on the ground and the host rocks to the right. And you can see the scale down there on the bottom. You know, it was up to uh, five, a, a number of miles out, miles out, before you got to the supposed age of the host rocks. As you came closer and closer to the granite, see how those ages went, woo, all the way down till they were close to the age of the granite? That's because two things happen. What did the granite introduce? Heat and water. The heat and the water permeated out into the host rocks and changed, contaminated, these dating methods, these dating systems, to give younger ages than the supposed ages of these host rocks. Well, they're just chemical ages, in fact, not true ages. Well, let me give you another example. We go from the macro scale to the micro scale. Here we see on the screen a green biotite grain and a brown biotite grain. That's their names of a mineral, a mica mineral. And they're side by side. See each one of those stars? That's where the, the, uh, the scientists focus a beam on the sample and each one of those stars is an analysis point and you can see they're only 10 microns apart. That's well, 10, 10 widths of a human hair, okay? No, a width of a human hair is one as 10 microns. One human hair apart. What results did they get? You can see it here. At the edge, the grain was 515 million years old, analysis number two of grain B. That was the, the brown grain. As you went closer, further out into the grain, human hair width by human hair width, the age decreased down to 160 million years. Contamination, because argon was leaking in and out of that mineral. What about this example? Granites contain the mineral zircon. I put inherited in, in brackets, in quote marks, because that's the interpretation of the geologists. But zircons are intrinsic to the formation of a granite when it cools and crystallises. So 
Here's some examples of, of, of zircon grains that have been used, uh, been dated in granites. A Himalayan granite supposed to be 21 million years old, dated by other methods, had zircons in it that gave uranium lead ages up to 1,753 million years old, which is correct. The rock, the whole rock, or the mineral in the rock? Wouldn't you think the mineral in the rock would give the same age as the whole rock? Absolutely. A southeastern Australian granite, supposedly 426 million years old, based on other evidence, gave zircon ages up to 3,500 3, million years, 3,500 million years. A New Zealand granite, supposedly 370 million years old, zircons supposedly up to 1,638 million years. Now, you think that's bad. Look at this example. A Himalayan granite, supposedly 20 million years old, had zircon grains that gave ages up to 1.4 billion years, but another grain, monazite, gave uranium lead ages of minus 97 million years. And minus 97 million years means that the grains will form 97 million years into the future. They haven't formed yet. And that, that's from the same rock. Which age do you believe? None of them. Well, here's another example. They, they focus the beam, the beam onto different points on a crystal. They rotated the crystal. You can see the, the crystal has different, a shape with different faces. And as they rotated it, you had a different angle of the beam on different faces. Now, you'd expect the same grain would give you the same results. Look what you get. The age of the crystal varied between 1.8 and 2.3 billion years on 47 crystals from the one rock sample. So, it is insisted, though, that assumption number three, a constant decay rate, is universally true because the result in millions of years' ages are needed for evolution to be possible. But why should radioactive decay rates have always been constant at today's measured rates? Here's the four methods. Potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, uranium, lead, samarium, and dodinium. You know, most geologists only use one or two of these methods on the same rock samples. This is because the, they assume that all methods should ideally use the, uh, yield the same age for the same rock. After all, they're all different clocks, different atoms, but they all decay and they should give you the same result. That's what the textbooks say. In theory and practice, they should. But what if we were to test this by using all four methods on the same rock samples. And if we use the isochron technique, now I don't have time to go into details, but you can get an age from one sample or you can get it from multiple samples. Multiple samples means you decrease the error. It's called the isochron method. And that's the method we used when we collected samples in the Grand Canyon and dated them by all four methods. I say me. Uh, we, because I was involved in a research project that did this. First of all, we took samples from this diabase sill. That's where molten rock or magma, like volcanic lava, was squeezed ver uh, horizontally under the ground between other layers and crystallised. And what results do we obtain on this rock? Potassium argon, 841 million years and a half million years. Rubidium strontium, 1,060 million years. Lead, lead, 1,250 million years. Samarium, neem, 1,379 million years. Notice those methods don't agree with one another. The same samples, different methods. Notice that potassium is the youngest and lead, lead and samarium are the oldest. Well, we talked about the Cardenas basalt a few moments ago. What results do we attain on that? Potassium argon, 516 million years. Rubidium strontium, 1111 million years. Samarium nidium, 1588 million years. Notice that? The rubidium strontium is twice as large as, the, as potassium argon. Samarium nidium is three times as large. That's not very accurate. Notice again, potassium is the youngest. Samarium is the oldest. Well, here we see some what we call amphibolites in the Grand Canyon. That's where the basalt lavas got all metamorphosed. They got heat and pressure and turned them into a new rock. And look at the results we obtain. Rubidium strontium, 1,240 million years. Lead, lead, 1,883 million years. Samaritanium, 1,655 million years. 
Notice that none of these methods gave the same results on the same rock. We found that the multiple ages on these three different rock units are always different. They always disagree. But each of these rock units represent a unique or once-only geologic event. The formation of that sill between the layers, the metamorphism of the lavas, the heat and pressure, and the volcanic eruption of the lavas. So how is it they would give you different results? If the clocks were accurate, they would have always been ticking at the rates we measure today, so each clock should give you the same age for each rock units. Therefore, each clock must have been ticking at a different, faster rate than today to give those different ages. That's the only conclusion we can come to. Rather, we've got different ages using those methods, whereas they should give you the same... If, the, if there was the same rates, should be the same age. Different ages means different rates. Let me give you an example. The Cardenas basalt. While the, you have the eruption of the lavas, and between the eruption and today is one real-time period. There's only one true age from the eruption to the present. Well, notice this. In that real-time period, the potassium argon click ticked through, clock ticked through 516 million years, but the rubidium strontium clock ticked faster through 1111 million years, 111 million years, and the Samaritan clock ticked even faster through 1588 million years. The, the clocks didn't tick at the rates we measure today. They clicked faster. They ticked faster. So if they ticked at faster rates in the past, that means we can't trust the dating methods because the dates we get given today in the textbooks are based on the rates being the same as today. Whereas we've shown that they were faster in the past, say in a catastrophic event like the flood when other geological processes were also fast. And so... If you use the wrong assumptions, you're going to get the wrong results. Well, what is the Earth's real age? Let's do this quickly in the remaining time. We have to understand that all scientific evidence for the age of the Earth is bold, it involves unprovable assumptions. We weren't there in the past. A process is chosen whose rate can be measured in the present. Some suitable and reasonable starting conditions are assumed but cannot be proven because no scientist was there at the start to observe them. And it is assumed that the process rate was constant since the start at the same rate measured today, even though no scientists have been present over time to verify this assumption. So all such processes can only give a qualitative, not absolute, maximum age for the Earth. And remember, we said before that most dating methods give a young age. Let's illustrate some of those quickly for you. Well, first of all, look at galaxies. You're all familiar with galaxies that have these spiral arms. They're, 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 the spiral arms move as the centre of the galaxy rotates, but those arms lag behind, and so eventually they're going to wind up. The galaxies are winding up so fast that they should have wound up within 0.3 billion years, yet the galaxies are supposed to be 10 billion years old. So the galaxies have to be much, much younger than that because they haven't been wound up yet. What about supernova or exploded stars? They leave smoke rims or remnants. And we can look back and see how many remnants there are observable in our galaxy. And we can, we can look through history as to how many exploding stars occur through history. We only find 200 remnants today and at the rate at which we know stars explode from observation, that's only about seven to 14,000 years' worth. Remember, these are not absolute. These are not absolute ages, but they indicate the youthfulness of our solar system. What about comets? They're dirty snowballs that orbit through the solar system. That's right. They're made up of, of, of dust and ice. So when the, sun, when the comet comes near the sun, the solar wind blasts off particles that stream out behind, that become the tail of the comet. Now, the comets are supposed to have formed at the same time as the solar system, about five billion years ago. But we've observed, we've even seen recently today, in the, this year, 
that comets have crumbled away before our very eyes. And we can look at comets like Halley's Comet that keep returning and every time they get smaller and smaller because they're disintegrating, they're crumbling and the lifetime of these comets are less than 10,000 years. Therefore, if they're as old as the solar system, our solar system is less 10,000 years old. Oh, they say there's a source of comets, new comets. No, that's not be proven. We don't have time to go into that. What about the Earth's magnetic field? From real-time measurements, we know it's losing its energy. The Earth's magnetic field is generated by electrical currents in the Earth's core. And we know from real-time measurements that it loses half of its energy every 1,400 years. But we also know that during the flood, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field flipped, reversed a number of times, and so that would cause a loss of energy at an even faster rate than what we observe today. Here's these historic measurements. Real-time historic measurements, we can see that the strength of the Earth's magnetic field has been declining through recorded history. If we go back we know that there were reversals. We know what it was like from magnetic particles in, in pottery, in the clay that baked, was baked into pottery, what it was like back in earlier parts of, of human history. And if we extrapolate that rate backwards, if we ignore the flood, we'll go back 10,000 years and the, the, the Earth would have a magnetic field as strong as a magnetic star. When we take into the, count the flood, where there would have been a lot of rapid energy loss due to those reversals, that age comes right down. And so from the magnetic field and its energy loss, we could say the maximum age for the Earth is 10,000 years at the very most. Have you ever noticed that the continents are eroding? Every time it rains, we get dirt and mud washed off the, the ground down into the rivers and they go out to the sea. Uh, we can measure the rate from the mud that's, kept, that's going out down rivers every year. At the present rates, do you realise the continents will all have eroded to sea level in no more than 14 million years? So why have we still got continents if the, if the Earth is three and a half, uh, sorry, four and a half billion years old? Well, where does that mud go? It goes down into the ocean. Is there billions of years' worth of mud on the ocean floor? No. There's only about 12 million years worth when we look at the rate coming in and the amount that's on the, on, the, on the ocean floor, how much leaves. What about salt? You know, the sea is not salty enough. We can measure how much salt goes into the sea, how much salt comes out, and we take the element sodium, and what do we find? We know how much is going in, how much is going out. We can do a calculation. If we started with fresh water at the current rate, we get the saltiness of the oceans in only 62 million years. Oh, the oceans are supposed to be at least 3 billion years old, according to the evolutionists. So if they're 3 billion years old, they'll be so saturated with salt, we can almost walk on the oceans. Oh, but you say to me, but wait a minute, there's assumptions involved. That's right. Let's put on biblical glasses... Would God have started with a freshwater ocean? Well, maybe not, because he made fish that could survive in salt water. Ah, oh, and salt gets added every year by rivers, erosion, weathering, rivers down to the ocean. Ah, oh. during the flood, there would have been so much more salt added. In fact, most of the salt would have been added during the flood. And that was only four and a half thousand years ago. You see what happens when you put on biblical glasses? That estimate comes right, right down. Not 62 million years, only thousands. It's the same with the mud. If you assume the rate today, what, what about the mud that accumulated rapidly with the floodwaters were washing off the, uh, at the, uh, off the earth at the end of the continents at the end of the flood? Most of the mud would have gone in the ocean in, the, in just a few years at the very most. Well, so these are only maximums. When you put on biblical glasses and biblical assumptions, you can so they very closely match what the biblical record says for the age of the earth. Well, biological materials also decay too fast. You know, they've found DNA in, in bones, in amber. Uh, they've revived Permian 
Bacteria are supposed to be 250 million years old. They found DNA in the uh, Neanderthal fossils. They then found dinosaur blo red blood cells. And yet we know the DNA red blood cells degenerate very rapidly. In only thousands of years, there wouldn't, shouldn't be any bl red blood cells left in dinosaur tissues. So they have to be only thousands of years old, not millions and millions of years old. We mentioned carbon-14 before. Well, most people don't know that wood, shell, bone fossils, coal, oil, natural gas, all contain radiocarbon. That's in the secular scientific literature. Materials that have ages of millions of years give standard radiocarbon ages of less than 50,000 years. Coal, less than 50,000 radiocarbon years. Oh, but you've got to put on the biblical glasses to take into account biblical assumptions about the, the, the carbon cycle as a result of the flood, before the flood, during, uh, before the flood in the pre-flood world, how much vegetation there was, etc., etc. When you correct those carbon-14 ages, they come down to only 5,000 years, about the time back to the flood, when these shells and wood, etc., the trees died during the flood. What about diamonds? Diamonds have even been shown to have young radiocarbon ages. You cannot contaminate a, a diamond internally because they're the hardest known substance. You cannot contaminate them externally, yet their conventional ages are between one and three billion years. Their standard radiocarbon ages are about 60,000 years or less when you put on the biblical glasses to give you the biblical assumptions, they come down to less than 10,000 years. And if the diamonds go back to the beginning of the earth and they're only that young, then the earth itself is only that young. Oh, but people say, no, no, skeptics say, and by the way, don't believe what you see online, on blogs and websites. If they haven't been peer-reviewed, as most of them haven't, they made these wild claims. They say that neutrons from uh, uh, uranium in, trapped in the diamonds can produce can produce the carbon-14 from nitrogen. No, there's not enough of that in the diamonds to produce the levels of carbon-14 that we actually measure. Well, quickly moving on. When uranium decays, it not only produces lead, it produces helium as a byproduct. And we take zircon crystals that give a uranium-lead age of one and a half billion years, and we look at how much helium is left in them. When we measure the helium leakage rate and compare how much helium has been produced in one and a half billion years of supposed one and a half, supposed one and a half billion years of uranium decay to lead, how much helium there should be, and about how much is left, and knowing the rate of leakage, guess what? The helium leakage age is only about 6,000 years. That means all that uranium decay occurred in only 6,000 years of real time. Decay rates were faster in the past, as we just illustrated earlier, from other evidence. Well, that helium gas goes up into the atmosphere. If you start with no helium in the atmosphere, add that helium from rocks and minerals leaking out, the amount of helium we have in the atmosphere today would have accumulated a maximum of 2 million years. I could go on. More details are available on our website, of course. What about the Stone Age graves? Do you realise the scientists say, the evolutionists say that there was a Stone Age for 195,000 years where people lived and died and in that period they say the, the average population level would have been about a million people. So in that time, you would have 8 billion people who lived and died through 195,000 years. Where are all their graves? Why do we find so few human remains? Because the Stone Age was not that long. And they weren't dummies. Why did they use stone tools? Well, when they left the Tower of Babel, they couldn't take the technology with them, so they picked up stones to use as tools. There were people using stone axes alongside people using techniques, uh, more advanced techniques in Egypt and, and Mesopotamia, where the people who spread out, had to use stone tools, just like we've got stone tool people today in Papua New Guinea, where you've got people using steel axes in Australia side by side with them. Well, what about agriculture? 
Do you think these people lived for 195,000 years through the Stone Age and it, none of them figured out that putting a seed in the ground, you'd generate plants for food? Yet agriculture was only, quote, quote, discovered at less than 10,000 years ago. So if agriculture was only discovered, well, but wait a minute, Noah planted a vineyard after the flood. Agriculture has always been with the human population. Therefore, the human history is very short. Written history is short. Man has always been intelligent. Do you realise that he kept records of the lunar phases? We can see that in various monuments. We can see it in cave paintings. Man has always been intelligent. He didn't wait 195,000 years to develop the skills to write. No, written history is short, therefore human history is short. And finally, my last example, the human population growth is just recent. You know, if you look at the generation span today of 40 years, say, at two and a half children per family, in four and a half, uh, four and a half thousand years, you'd get the seven billion people that are alive on earth today. But the current averages are higher than that, three and a half children per family, a 2% growth rate. That's four times the growth rate that I used in that calculation. So you get many more people in four and a half thousand years than today's seven billion that would count for all those that died early, died in war, died of diseases, etc. You know, if evolution were true and man evolved a million years ago, using population growth statistics, there ought to be one person on every square foot of the Earth's surface with 15 other people standing on their shoulders. Where are they all? That's because human history is only short. Well, our time is gone. We need to wrap this up. Most dating methods say that the world is young. Let me remind you that all scientific evidence for the age of the Earth involves unprovable assumptions. All such processes can only ever give a qualitative, not absolute, maximum age. Our only certainty is the God-breathed eyewitness account in the scriptures of the Earth's age and history. You know, if you want to know how old you are, what do you do? You go to your birth certificate, which was given to you from the eyewitnesses who wrote down exactly when you were born, who saw you get born. God saw the Earth as born, he made it, and he's given us the birth certificate in the scriptures. That's the true age of the, earth, of the earth. So, should the observations of the world around us by finite, fallible, fallen human beings, scientists, be interpreted, interpreted by them based on assumptions that reject the authority of, word, of God's word, be given precedence over the clear God-breathed, scriptures, uh, God-breathed statements of scriptures? No. Men who reject the scriptures are interpreting the evidence. Why should we use their interpretations to reinterpret what God tells us? Their reasoning insists that today's natural processes are the only scientific means for calculating the Earth's age, especially those few processes, the less than 10%, that yield a very old age for the Earth. We, but of course, we shouldn't observe the observable data. No. It's God's world and he made it and he's given us brains to use to worship him with our minds, our hearts, our souls and all our beings. But we must always recognise that our observations will always be tainted by finite, fallible, fallen human reasoning. I'm not fallible. I'm fallible. I'm finite. Don't believe me. Believe God's word. When we submit to the authority of God's word, then our science conducted in the light of the scriptures does confirm God's word as we've seen here today. Yes, science does provide answers, as we've seen, that confirms the earth's real age is very young, as plainly evident in the light of scriptures. But why does this matter? Is it just a scientific issue? No. I alluded to this earlier as we close. Let me go back to the scriptures. What did Jesus say in John 3 verse 12? I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And four verses later in John chapter 3, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If we can't believe the earthly things, in the beginning God created, how are we going to believe the he heavenly things? 
for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's why this matters. You see, the secular scientists say that Adam and Eve must have been living on a fossil graveyard because there's been billions of dead things in the ground underneath them from the millions of years of evolutionary history. And they say death and struggle brought man into existence. No. God's word says that God created a perfect world. There was no death, disease, suffering. Man brought that into the world as a result of his rebellion against God. Death came as a result of man's sin. And, you know, we've got a specific example that we can point to. When were, are we told in the Bible when, fossil, or when thorns came into existence? They weren't there in the Garden of Eden. We're told specifically in Genesis chapter 3 that thorns were, came into existence as a result of the curse. They came after the curse, not before. And yet the geologists say that they've found fossilised thorns that are supposedly 400 million years old. 400 million years before man came existence, they say. Guess who's right? God, because he was there, the scientists weren't. The 400 million years could never have happened. The thorns came after man rebelled against God and brought sin into the world. And finally, how will people believe the good news unless they first of all believe the bad news? The bad news is that man is lost. He needs a saviour because of his sin. Where do we learn about that? We learn about that in Genesis. If that isn't real, literal history, then how is we saved by Jesus on the cross? Ultimately, the age Earth's matter, the Earth's age matters because the cross of Jesus Christ matters. If we can't believe what the creator Jesus Christ told us in Genesis chapter 1, how can we believe that his cross, his death, was for all people in all places throughout time, all time, because as the creator, he could die for everyone in all times and all places. And because he was a creator, he could rise from the dead. Hallelujah. We worship a living saviour. That's why the earth's matter, earth age matters. And both the scriptures and science declare that the earth is young. Well, you've been very patient. Let me wrap up with just a few resources you won't remember half of what I've told you, so it's important that you have materials that you can go to so that you can learn more about these issues. First of all, there's our pocket guides. They're very helpful because they're very small, they're very inexpensive. There's one on the six days showing you from Scripture how long those days in Genesis 1, all the things that I've talked about and more. Then this pocket guide, the best evidences, summarising some of those evidences I've gave you with illustrations so that you can... You can learn up that information. And a young earth dealing with radioisotope dating, radioactive dating, and also radiocarbon dating. You'll find that very helpful. Then a similar presentation of this was given uh, some years ago. It's been recorded on this DVD. Here's another preservation. Uh, that, so that's on science confirms a young earth. And this one is of the age of the earth, circular reasoning and crucial assumptions in the millions of years. And... Uh, here we've got uh, circular reasoning in dating methods. It deals with radiocarbon, tree rings, and also valves. Uh, here's another set of DVDs that have been collected. There's one on radioactive and radio uh, radiocarbon dating, another on radio halos, fossil uh, radioactivity preserved in the rocks, and, and bonus materials there that are all wrapped in this special package. And then there's my two-volume work, Earth's Catastrophic Past, Geology, Creation and the Flood. It's two volumes, 1,100 pages, a lot of material, but short chapters. It's, uh, well, easy enough read if you take it steadily, but it has sections dealing with the age of the earth, the evidences, the radioactive dating methods, and much, much more. I go through all the details of scriptures, look at all the scientific evidence, and show from science, and the, the science confirms the scriptural record of creation and the flood, and more. And it's a two-volume set that you buy together. Don't forget our Answers magazine. It's a, a family magazine. It has a children's uh, magazine as well. It comes with two issues, the adults and children. You can also get digital. Uh, you can just, uh, get the digital version as well that you can have on different devices. And don't forget our website is an instant resource. If you have a question, the first place you go is to our website. And not only do we have the lay articles, but we also have the technical articles. 
Uh, we have the Answers Research Journal. They are, they are technical papers that are the underpinnings of all the evidences that we present at the lay level. You can go to the technical details, drill down, get all the references and get all the technical information. And that's available free of charge online on our website, Answers Research Journal. Look for it on the Answers in Genesis homepage. Don't forget that while the Ark and the Museum close, and you haven't got much longer, because we're opening again soon, that there's free shipping on orders of 50 or more. Don't forget the Creation Apologetics Masterclasses 1 to 6. They're at a, a, a discounted rate while the Ark and the Museum is closed. So time is running out. But don't forget to reopen. We need your generosity. Without the, the revenue over these past few months, we desperately need help to open the Ark and the Museum again. So don't forget, we need you to donate. And if you enjoyed these programs, don't forget, we've got a regular schedule. Go on our website, these live programs coming up to this afternoon, seven tonight, uh, sorry, this afternoon at two and four o'clock uh, this afternoon. And you can see the schedule there. But all these programs are now, including these presentations, are going on our answers.tv uh, internet web uh, uh, live streaming platform and we've everything's going to be in one place and you can subscribe there's a week the seven day trial if you want to test it out before you sign up but uh, answers.tv is the place to go we've got over a thousand of these now we've even got Spanish uh, Spanish presentations and materials and uh, that means you can watch from anywhere in the world at the same price $39.99 per year. That's a really inexpensive for the incredible content that you can get, content that you get. So check that out, answers.tv. You can have year-round repetition of all this information and learn it thoroughly and use it to witness to others. And finally, coming this summer, we're going to launch uh, answers.tv on all sorts of different devices so you can... Con uh, use this content anywhere you go, anywhere in the world. Well, thank you very much. You've been very patient. Have a good day. And remember, Scripture and science confer confirm, declare a young world, a young earth. Thank you.